All right, in this um, in this video we're going to be talking about general hash functions. So I hope after the videos that we've watched on hash functions and thinking about how um, hash maps and hash sets uh, use hash functions, um, I hope that you've been thinking that maybe uh, you don't need to necessarily have a custom hash function for every particular type of key that you write. And you don't, um, so there's a lot of general hash functions that can be used um, in order to create like a good uh, hash function for different types of keys. So um, the built-in hash function um, uses something called a functor. So uh, we've talked about this uh, a couple different times when we've had to pass around functions um, into other functions, uh, but basically you create an object, um, a hash object, uh, and then that object is um, actually a function itself, and that function is um, going to take in a string and return out an index, and this is something that's custom, or I mean, sorry, that's implemented with um, C++ libraries. Uh, all you really need to know is that there's basically a built-in hash function in C++ that can like generally hash things, and it's pretty good. Um, you know, at doing it for um, whatever type uh, you pass in. So I have a little demo that I want to show for this. So here is um, that code that I just showed you. So this is the C++ um, built-in hash function. So it's like a general hash function that can work for, you know, any string key. Um, and it does a pretty good job. And there's a ton of other general hash hash functions um, that you can find. So Zybooks shows you this one here. It's called the multiplicative string function. Um, I'm going to talk in the last slide a little bit about what this is actually doing, but um, this is one uh, option for a hash function. Basically just like messes with the string enough that um, it does a pretty good job of avoiding too many collisions. Um, this is also another general hash function for passing in a string. It's basically just adding up the ASCII val value values of each element of, or each character in the string. Um, there's the ELF hash function uh, that um, is cited here and in the slides is another option of just kind of like wild things that it's doing. One thing that you'll notice, and if you haven't taken 261 yet, is a lot of the hash functions will do bit manipulations. So a lot of these operations are bit manipulations that you might not be familiar with yet. Um, so this is a left shift operator on a binary number. Um, and so uh, uh, they basically just like mess with it enough <laughs> that it creates a good index. Um, this is another one that's in here as well. So anyway, um, let's run it. There's basically just a bunch of different hash functions that, that are being tested, and they're being tested on a couple of different files that hold a bunch of strings. So the first one is just a bunch of English words, and putting those all into a hash table and checking how the hash functions handle collisions. So the one that sums the ASCII values, uh, the worst case chain pro probe length is 662. The multiplicative string hash function has a worst case of two, uh, so significantly better than sort of a really simple hash function. And then the built-in C++ um, has uh, no collisions, so worst case chain, chain or probe length of one. Uh, let's try it again with the emails, so a slightly less um, like something with like a little bit more pattern, right? Like emails have more pattern than just random strings. Um, okay, so the simple hash function does a little better um, with the emails, uh, so it's at 300 as the worst case, but you'll see the multiplicative and the built-in C++ hash function both have worst case of 17. So 
So in my slides here, uh, I basically just summarize what I just showed you in the demo if you want to come back and look at it um, without having to pull up any code. Um, so this is what we saw. Um, yeah, and so uh, one thing to think about is so the emails.txt file uh, contained 100,000 emails. And uh, with the hash table, uh, we're getting collisions and the worst case is 17, right? So if we wanted to store this data in a real app, um, should we use this hash table or would a balanced tree be better? Just an interesting thing to think about, right? Well, it turns out that either of them would be about the same. And the reason for this is, as we know, a balanced tree is going to have log n um, complexity for uh, lookup, search, and remove. And so um, if we take the log of 100,000, uh, we're going to get uh, 5. Um, I should make sure I'm doing that right. Should be log base two. Look at it, log base ten. So log base two of One hundred. Yeah, so log base two of I did log base ten, sorry. Um log base two of a hundred thousand is around seventeen. So um using the tree versus using the um custom or sorry, the general hash functions, either the multiplicative um, string or the C++ built-in, they all give you about the same thing, so there would be really no difference. Um, only thing is that we are looking at worst case, um, so average case um, is probably better with the hash table than with the um, tree. So let's look a little bit more at the multiplicative string um, presented in Zybooks just to kind of get a little bit better idea of what this is actually doing. Again, if you haven't taken 261, um, this might be uh, really confusing. Um, and I think probably the majority of you haven't taken it, but if any of you have, then this, you know, you'll have seen this um, for a second time. So, or you'll, you'll have seen some of this before some of these symbols. So the idea of this algorithm is that you loop through the characters and every character basically um, uh, like rehashes um, the same value. So um, the hash gets started off at a number of 5,381 um, and it's a like really uh, full 64-bit type there. You can see it's long long. And then all you do is you take the bits of that number and you just start manipulate the, manipulating them um, in a loop for every character. So um, for every character what you're going to do is take that hash number and you're going to um, left shift by five. So left shifting by fi five is basically um, doing a binary shift. It's not exactly this, but imagine that you basically just like um, move the bits over by five, like you shift the bits over by five. Um, you have to like obviously consider what happens on the edges and stuff, but that's basically what a left shift does. Um, what it does if it were not a binary number, um, what it's just doing to the number is it's multiplying it by 32. Um, so, you know, you're like moving it over five places, power of two. Um, and so by doing this, you're multiplying by 32. And then um, 
effectively what you're doing is by adding the hash you're multiplying it actually by 33 um, which is kind of confusing um, but you know this is multiplying by 32 this is another one so it's actually 33 and then you're just adding on whatever bits are in the character that you're at you're going character by character and adding it on so um, uh, in the end um, it's just kind of like messing with the bits, you know, in this pattern, and it ends up doing a pretty good job, right? Like we saw in the um, in the demo. But what I wanted to show you is um, it is important that you're shifting by that 33. So if we go back to this here and we take this out and just shift by 32, or just multiply by 32, just shift by 5. Um, and run it. So we were getting 17 collisions for the emails.txt for that one. And now if we do the shift by 30, um, the shift by 5 and multiply by 32 and you know instead of the 33, you can see that we get way more um, uh, way more collisions. Um, so it is important that it's like this prime number that you're multiplying it by, right? So that you get less um, uh, collisions. And the reason that you see so many collisions um, is because you are also at the end, because if you just did this, you would have way too many, um, your array would have to be way too way too big there'd be way too many different options and so this is a case where the remainder comes in handy so when you do the remainder of the max value for a uint um, that is going to reduce the number in the array and so that's where a lot of the collisions are coming in and that's why it's really important that you're multiplying this by the prime number of 33 um, rather than by 32. Um, okay so uh, that is a little bit about general hash functions. I hope you just get the idea of it, which is that, uh, of course, writing a custom hash function and having a perfect hash function that doesn't allow for any collisions sounds like a great idea. Um, but there's two big problems with that. One problem is that it often leads to really large arrays that are larger than necessary or larger um, than you would want. Uh, second problem is that they're hard to come up with. Um, it's hard to come up with a perfect hash function. And so there's been, you know, just a lot of research and um, study into writing good general hash functions. Um, uh, and so this is one example of them, um, particularly for a string. As a final reminder, as we kind of wrap up our uh, discussion on hash functions, is that we are, one, one of the reasons that we're really interested in hash functions for this class is because they can um, help us write um, and implement abstractions using, using hash tables. So in C++, um, the hash map um, abstraction is called an unordered map and a hash set is called an unordered set. And so now we talked about it way back on like week three and four that there's two different kinds of maps, there's two different kinds of types of sets. You've now like fully explored how trees work, right? And under the hood, how you can implement a map with a tree, right? And now you're able to see exactly why uh, implementing a map with a hash table is now 01 right? And it really helps you because you don't need to memorize it anymore. Um, before, you probably were just looking at all these different abstractions and saying, okay, well, a stack is 01, a queue is, you know, 01, a linked list is, you know, ON if it's possibly at the back, you know, you were kind of just like keeping track of all these different abstractions and what it costs to do different things. Um, and now, that you have like a deeper understanding of the implementations behind maps in these two options, uh, it can make it so that it's now kind of more innate to understand. It's not something you have to memorize um, when you think about uh, choosing abstractions um, to solve your problems. 
that's it. So that is all I have. Thanks so much.